Any announcer who aspires to become a play-by-play -play sports announcer should master the art of general announcing first. While there's no hard and fast rule, the average announcer should have at least one year of solid experience in front of a microphone before he's ready to specialize in any one phase of announcing. Assuming you have the desire and determination to become a sports broadcaster, what steps can you take to prepare yourself? It's obvious that you must first be a dedicated sports fan with a wide general knowledge and appreciation of at least all the major sports. If you tend to follow one or two particular sports, the first thing you'll have to do is diversify your interests. Watch every sporting event that you possibly can. If there are sports with which you are not thoroughly familiar, learn all you can about them. When you go to a game, try to go with someone who knows that sport intimately. Discuss the strategy and the finer points of the game. Your best bet is usually a former player. Many fans take a casual approach to sports, and even after years of regular attendance, they may never learn much beyond the basics. Build yourself a sports library. Get the record and rule books on every sport you can, and study them. This is vital. Keep them on hand for permanent reference. You should know the rules of every sport you cover as thoroughly as the umpires and referees do. In short, you must become an expert. Good sports reporting is the epitome of ad lib. So when you're studying the theories and principles in Lesson 31, Ad Lib in Action, remember that they apply just as directly to sports announcing as they do to every form of ad lib. Preparation is absolutely vital. It's easy to tell if a sportscaster has done enough advanced preparation. The smooth flowing commentary you hear on the air is the result of many hours of preparation. It's also likely the product of teamwork by a well-coordinated broadcasting crew. In the case of football, for example, the announcer may be assisted by two spotters and a statistician. The approach will vary with the particular crew, but one spotter may identify the defensive players while the other watches the offensive team. On every play, the spotters will point out the names of the participating players for the benefit of the play-by-play -play announcer. Accuracy is important, and so is timing. Quick identification of players, timely facts and figures, are vital to a clear word picture of a fast-moving ball game. The statistician is also an important member of the team. While the announcer describes a pass play, the statistician will quickly calculate the number of yards the pass traveled and the exact distance the receiver covered before he was tackled. These quick facts may be scribbled on notes and handed immediately to the play-by-play -play commentator. The announcer needs the extra eyes of his assistants, and he must learn to use them to best advantage. In selecting a crew, remember once again, former players are the best bet. The people who played the game usually know it best. Learning to identify players is an art in itself. Of course, if you're thoroughly familiar with a team's personnel, there's no problem. But if you're confronted with covering unfamiliar teams on short notice, it may be a different matter. The top professionals say they do an intensive study of the players in pregame practice. They look for unusual or distinguishing characteristics in each player and try to build an association around it. Athletes in uniform tend to look alike. But if you look closely, the chances are you'll find some little detail that will set them apart. Try to associate the player's name with some unusual thing you notice. It may be the color of his hair, his type of build, or something about his style of play. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages of pursuing a career as a sportscaster? First of all, you must remember that in any field of specialization, the opportunities are obviously mathematically fewer. But once in the fraternity, the sportscaster enjoys his own special niche. For one thing, he's no longer in direct competition with general announcers, and his earning power is usually better than average. Most sporting events these days take place at night, so the sportscaster must be prepared to work irregular hours. He may be required to do several sportscasts a day in addition to his play-by-play -play work. He's often on the air both early in the morning and late at night. 
The life of the sportscaster tends to become dominated by the sports world and the members of its fraternity. It's more than an occupation, it's a way of life. In some cases, it can become almost a one-dimensional existence. Back on the plus side of things, the sportscaster often receives more recognition than the general announcer. He is often in demand as a guest speaker and master of ceremonies. His specialization usually also results in a great deal of independence and working autonomy. He organizes and plans his own work and usually carries it through himself. The average sportscaster does plenty of traveling and he usually goes first class. In the final analysis, he must have an all-consuming desire to work and live with sports most of the time. But if you have the dedication and determination, the overall rewards can be high. With today's transistorized tape machines, the aspiring sports announcer can get plenty of practice. When sports events are carried by TV, try turning down the sound and describing the play-by-play -play on your tape machine. You won't see as much of what's happening as if you were there in person, of course, but it's excellent practice nevertheless. Conforming to the given circumstances will require even more concentration than usual. Take your tape machine to live sports events and practice your technique. You can usually find an isolated place to work at little league games, track and field meets, and other open air events. When you study these tapes, Compare your work with that of the pros. Is it accurate, smooth flowing, colorful? Listen to the pros. Study the announcers you hear. What do you like or dislike about their work? Showmanship is vital to good sports reporting. It's also the hardest element to define. The term would mean a hundred different things to a hundred different people. But when it's applied to sports announcing, some of the things it does mean are Imagination, a sense of the dramatic, originality, timing, and the artistic sense of knowing when and how to use them all. A good way to begin is to practice the simulated play-by-play -play material that goes with this lesson. During the course of a typical broadcast day, the average radio station may schedule upward of 200 different commercial announcements. These commercials plead a myriad of causes with dozens of different approaches. The advertiser's message may take the form of a hard sell spot announcement, an informal ad lib type approach, or perhaps a catchy jingle. Each product or service that's extolled to the listener may require a slightly different treatment. Announcements may vary in length, anywhere from five or ten seconds to a full minute and perhaps even longer. It brings with it the danger of sameness and the possibility of a particular appeal not getting through to the audience. The prime objective in the minds of the writer and announcer is to make an impression on the listener, to catch his attention, to arouse his interest, to firmly implant the benefits of the product or service in the listener's mind and to motivate him into becoming a buyer. With the constant bombardment of commercial messages, there is a natural tendency for the average listener to mentally tune out during the commercial and to tune back in when it's over. In the case of television, a few years ago, the New York City Waterworks inadvertently conducted a revealing survey for the TV industry concerning the listener response to commercials. They found that on some of the nation's top TV shows, there was a tremendous upsurge in the consumption of water that corresponded to the timing of the commercials within these shows. This obviously meant that many thousands of listeners were captivated by the entertainment portion of the shows, but were using the commercial periods to run to the kitchen or bathroom, hence the tremendous increase in water consumption. To offset listener resistance, it's obviously necessary to stimulate his interest with a variety of approaches. This, of course, is not to say that all listeners resent all commercials. Far from it. Many listeners find the commercials just as entertaining or interesting as the actual program content. 
Women especially tend to be receptive to all forms of advertising. This applies to printed media as well. Department store and similar type ads often enjoy far more readership than other sections of the newspaper. One approach that's often used on both radio and TV is the dialogue commercial. Often the purpose is to dramatize the merits of the sponsor's product with a simulated real life situation. Here's an example of the dialogue commercial in its simplest form. Hi, Bill. Hey, you look like you lost your last friend. What's the trouble? Buying a house. Brother, I've looked at houses till I'm dizzy and still no luck. Not only that, we have to sell our present house. And that's a real headache, too. Well, why do it the hard way? There's an easy way? Sure, just phone Apex Real Estate. Give them an idea what kind of house you want and what you want to pay. They'll do the hunting. And they'll help you sell your house, too. Not only that, but Apex Real Estate will help with financing, and they'll help arrange insurance on all your property. Sounds great. Do you have their number? Sure. It's Whitehall 7291. Oh, and another thing, Bill. Mm-hmm. Apex has a 50-year record of satisfied customers, so you can depend on them. Got that number down? Whitehall 7291. As you can hear, the dialogue commercial confronts the announcer with at least a minor acting challenge. Oddly enough, many announcers find it difficult to deliver a line of dialogue in a convincing and natural way. This is something that comes with practice. Dialogue commercials are always recorded in advance. They may be done by advertising agencies, commercial recording houses, or by the station's own staff using station facilities. This type of work often pays the announcer an extra fee depending upon station policy. Of course, if it is done by an outside agency, a talent fee is always paid. It follows that the more vocally flexible you become, and the more characters you can portray, the greater your chances of being asked to do dialogue commercials. If you have a bent for imitations or character voices, by all means develop it. In the commercial we just heard, the voices were straight. The man you'll hear in a moment has developed a wide variety of both original voices and imitations of the voices of famous people. He has often used this special talent to good advantage on radio and TV commercials. Here's an excerpt from one national advertising campaign in which he recorded a dozen or so different spot announcements imitating the voices of famous personalities. It's out of this world. From Venus and Mars, and from all the stars, comes word of Weston's new cracked wheat loaf. Listen to this star. Hello, folks. This is Jimmy. You know something, folks? Mr. Weston has discovered a loaf of bread called cracked wheat. Now, just ankle down to your corner, grocer, and it's in a forever amber wrapper. Try it. It's colossal. It's stupendous. It's out of this world. Here's another example of versatility. In this dialogue commercial, both voices are done by the same announcer. All right now, just lie there quietly and tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Well, I remember a take-home department. Yes, go on. Everyone was placing an order. Then what happened? Suddenly I rushed to the counter. I wanted to make sure I got my share of Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> there, 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 now, that's perfectly normal, son. Everyone loves Kentucky Fried Chicken. That's why Champs puts it up in boxes and buckets. Now, why don't you pick up an order when you leave here at any of Champ's four locations? Ooh, you're such a nice man. A dialect is often used in both monologue and dialogue commercials. This can be a handy device when there is an obvious tie-in, such as a St. Patrick's Day sale, Robbie Burns Day promotion, or some similar theme where a dialect may be used to advantage. The dialect may be less than perfect, but you can be sure it'll attract attention. Here's a monologue commercial built around what we can only call one announcer's version of fractured German. Guten Morgen, ladies. This is Chef Strudel with some timely cooking ins. Now, if you want to make delicious poultry for your guests, just buy a 10-pound chicken. Stir up some flour. You brown the chicken in the roaster for about an hour. Sprinkle on some garlic and onion salt. Add carrots, celery, and pour a quart of water over the bird. 
Then you wait for a couple of hours while you cook at 960 degrees Fahrenheit. Take it out of the oven, sprinkle with pepper, then serve to your guests. When they taste it, they say, Ooh, it stinks. So then you buy a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken at Champs like you should have done in the first place. Dialogue commercials are usually dressed up with some sort of production. Attention-getting devices such as sound effects, fanfares, and jingles are commonly used. To round out our examples, here's a dialogue commercial done with dialects with a catchy jingle at the opening and closing. For the best used car, not, sales. not one abused car, sales. come down today, come down today. Shop, the Bandman way. shop the Bandman way. Mr. President, I will give you the 1,200 prisoners, which I would otherwise send to the sugar fields, if you will give me the one thing nearest and dearest to my heart, my gentle heart. You mean 500 tractors? Oh, not at all. A used car from Bandman Auto. Bandman Auto sales is best. We're the bank's largest, best by test. Long-term financing there. Low interest rate. Shop and auto sale. Those are some typical examples of the dialogue commercial in action. It's obvious that this approach offers the advertiser an extra dimension in presenting his sales story to the listener. It gives him a chance to make his message stand out from the others, to dramatize the use of his service or product to create goodwill through entertainment or humor, to sugarcoat the selling points that he wants to get across. To develop your own vocal flexibility, try imitating the voices you heard in these commercials and work at creating some of your own. Vocal gymnastics, dialects, and character voices are certainly not requirements of normal announcing assignments, but being able to use them for specialized purposes will add to your versatility and probably your income. In considering the many forms that the radio TV commercial may take, we must remember that the prime objective of all commercials is to break through the listener's inertia, capture his attention, and get the sales story across. The problem of overcoming inertia is present in all kinds of selling. Any salesman knows this is the first obstacle to overcome if he is going to successfully impress his prospect. A salesman who makes personal calls on his clients, whether he's selling cosmetics or automobiles, knows that it's virtually useless to make a presentation to someone whose mind is on something else. You can be sure that your prospect is not conditioning his mind for your story, eagerly awaiting your appearance. His mind is undoubtedly occupied with any of a hundred other matters of more immediate concern. How to meet his tax bill, how to increase his profits and lower his costs, how his children are doing in school, what model new car he should buy. Before you make a successful presentation, you must refocus his stream of consciousness onto your product or service. He can only have one thought in his mind at any one given time until the prospect starts to actively think in the same vein you are thinking, you won't get anywhere. Radio program managers know that many listeners tend to listen to radio on an almost subliminal level. They listen with half an ear, enjoying the music as a background, while they consciously are thinking of something else. Programmers try to offset this tendency by inviting more active listener participation. Contests, draws, telephone calls to listeners, thought-provoking features, contrasting music tempos, timing and pacing, all play an important part in keeping the audience listening actively rather than passively. An attentive audience is fertile sales ground for the advertiser. Radio writers are faced with the difficult task of stimulating listener interest hundreds of times every day. Working with the single dimension of sound, they must use every possible means of penetrating the listener's consciousness. The approach must be compatible with the product. Beauty aids and social glamour obviously suggest a different approach than circuses and horror movies. Many advertising campaigns are built around long range objectives. Soft drink bottlers, chewing gum manufacturers, dry cleaners, beauty parlors, and dozens of other accounts may be heard on the air on a daily basis 
with jingles, informal commercials, time signals, and slogans that tap slowly away at listener consciousness. Implanting product identification, points on superior quality or service, and other long-range promotional objectives. On the other hand, there are many advertisers whose objectives are short-range. Often, their stories must be told with urgency and impact. Sensational sales, spectacular movies, sports events, contests, and dozens of other similar themes that require positive and immediate action on the part of the listener are often presented with flair and flamboyance. These announcements come under the category of the impact commercial. The impact commercial can take many forms. It may be single-voiced, multi-voiced, with or without music or sound effects. Let's examine some of the more common forms of the impact commercial. Our first example is a single-voiced commercial promoting a short-term sale. Ladies, if you sew, here's an event you don't want to miss. The first anniversary of Textile, Textile Discount, Discount Center. Center. Featuring a $1 sale. For just $1, you can buy cotton tea toweling in multicolored stripes, 17 inches wide. Anniversary, anniversary sale, sale price at, at six, six yards, yards for $1. 45 inch cotton and arnel in your favorite colors and patterns. Anniversary, anniversary sale price at $1 a yard. 36 inch Medicare ginghams in a huge assortment of colors and patterns. Anniversary sale price at one and a half yards for one dollar. And there are hundreds of other tremendous dollar specials during the anniversary sale at Textile Discount Center, 264 McDermott Avenue, just two blocks west of Maine. And don't forget, they're giving away free aprons, free theater passes, and free tape measures all this week at Textile Discount Center. Next comes the two voice impact commercial. In this case, extraneous words are eliminated. The copy is almost telegraphed. The lines are mostly descriptive phrases rather than full sentences. The pace is usually brisk, and the style of delivery is declamatory. The overall effect is a panorama of compelling sales points, each voice superimposing a new sales point over the previous one. Here's an example. Save more, save now at Easton's. Here is a special offer that will not be repeated again this year. Suede or leather jackets, dark shades only, regularly $4.50. Now for a limited time only, just $1.99. Easton's use methods and solutions approved by the manufacturers. Get the finest quality cleaning of a suede or leather jacket, dark shades only, just $1.99, now at Easton's. Have three shirts beautifully laundered. Starts to your individual request and buttons replaced. Regularly $0.81, cents, now just $0.69 cents at Easton's. Call 233-2401. Easton's. The economy quality dry cleaners. Two, three, three, two, four, oh, one. By adding music, sound effects, and voices on echo, we can heighten the effect and intensify the tone of the commercial. Here's another example of the impact commercial using two voices, an echo chamber, and mood music. The Lyceum Theater proudly presents Marco, Marco Polo. Polo. Mightiest adventure of them all, Marco, Marco Polo. In Cinemascope and Technicolor with a cast of 50,000, Marco, Marco Polo. Conqueror of the barbarian hordes of the Orient, Marco, Marco Polo. Polo. The spellbinding lover of a thousand exotic women, Marco, Marco Polo. Polo. Spectacular and mighty in its scope, Marco, Marco Polo. Polo. Starring Rory Calhoun is an all new screen masterpiece. For added thrills and excitement, you'll see... Five Bold Women, a tale of jealousy, greed, and murder. Crazy Hannah, the Strangler, wanted for murder. Big Pearl, armed robbery. Fargo Kitty, Missouri Lady, and Marie of the Night. All in the exciting motion picture, Five Bold Women. For truly great Technicolor screen entertainment, see... Marco Polo, Five Bold Women at the Lyceum Theater. Classification, adult. The examples you've heard on this lesson cover the main categories of the impact commercial. The two voice announcements with special effects must obviously be recorded in advance. To do an effective job on this type of announcement, you must develop the technique of force, a good sense of timing, and an appreciation of dramatic interpretation. If you do your practicing alone, here's a trick you might try. If you have a tape machine, use the practice material that goes with this lesson and record one of the voices on each announcement. Leave a suitable silent space between lines. When you play back the recorded portion, 
You can practice doing the second voice live. After you've mastered the lines of one announcer, record the others and alternate the live inserts. When we talk about the informal commercial, we imply that there is no attempt to overpower the listener. It's a soft, friendly, conversational type of selling done through the personality of the announcer involved. Often, this type of commercial is written especially for a particular personality. And sometimes, at the request of advertisers themselves, the personality may actually ad-lib the commercial because of complete familiarity with the product. He may use basic notes on major points that he wants to get across. This tends to give the performer a little more scope and allow him to use his imagination. With some announcers, it's liable to come out much more naturally and convincingly. As an example, let's assume we're listening to a disc jockey show, and it's time for the next commercial. Hey, customers, that was a bit of a goodie, huh? Hey, and speaking of goodies, have you been down for one of A&W's teen burgers lately? Well, you know, there are six A&W's right here in Winnipeg, and they're already willing and able to serve you with the nummiest, best-tasting burger that you've sunk your teeth into for a long time. Let me tell you what you get in an A&W teen burger. And I hope that you've all had supper, because if you haven't, you're going to be dashing off and spoiling it right off the bat. You get a pure beef patty, and this is all 100% pure beef. You get lettuce, cheese, mustard, relish. It's all on a sesame seed bun, toasted to perfection, topped off with mayonnaise and bacon, and mmm, boy, is it good. Now, you're going to find more burger for your money in this A&W Teen Burger, let me tell you. So drop around, say hi to any one of the guys. Tell them PJ sent you, won't you? And you can pop out to any one of your favorite locations, no matter where it is. If you're looking for the best in burgers, try one of those mm, good A&W burgers. And in particular, how about one of those A&W Teen Burgers? Gosh, they're fabulous. The voice you just heard extolling the merits of A&W Teen Burgers is Peter Jackson nationally known radio and TV personality. Peter is one of the industry's top exponents of the informal commercial, which we're examining right now. Pete, I can almost taste those burgers. Mm, they're good, too. Actually, Ed, you know the best way to do these commercials? Try the product that you talk about, then you're talking from experience. In other words, the most convincing commercials are the ones you believe. Mm -hmm, precisely. You should try to know your product and sell yourself in the first place. Well, that would certainly be an ideal situation. What about this casual conversational approach you do so well? Well, Ed, everything that I do on the air, I try to talk as if there were a single person listening. Now, you must feel that the listener is right there. You're not talking to 10,000 people, but you're talking to one single listener. Say, I'm glad you mentioned that, because in a previous lesson, we talked about developing the knack of talking to one specific imaginary listener. And you, Pete, of all people on the air, exemplify this technique to its ultimate. You consciously think of an imaginary listener. Oh, you? yes. I consciously think of this, Ed. I also try to develop the smile in your voice as you go along. I try to remember that, actually, I'm an invited guest in people's homes, and I feel that I only deserve their welcome if I'm friendly and pleasant. Who wants to grouch you, right? <laughs> and I like to feel that I can think about my listener the same way that he or she would think about me, that no matter where I was, under all circumstances, I could walk into any home that does listen to me, walk in and say, Hi, I'm Peter Jackson. Then we could sit down, have some nice, informal, easy conversation, and just as I would do it on the air. This suggests to me that the broadcasting personality must first have a, a genuinely warm feeling toward people, a basic liking for people. Oh, this, this is very true. I think you should feel that everybody who listens to you is listening because you're their type of people and vice versa. Pete, we both know good announcers who do not reflect this warmth toward people and humanity, mm -hmm. but technically many of them are fine announcers. True. What do you think an announcer can do to develop a, a humanized attitude and a, a deeper appreciation of people? Would certainly improve his approach on the air. What can he do to develop in this direction? Well, Ed, I, I believe he can do many things along this line. The most important thing is to get to know people, to do as many things as you can in the community, spend more time with all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. I think an announcer should look for opportunities at all times to meet new people, get to know them. And he shouldn't confine himself to just people of his own age or social level. 
he should develop the attitude that strangers are just friends that he hasn't met. And right. I think this way he will actually anticipate the friendliness on the part of that great unseen audience, and it will, it will show in his work. I think so. Well, I've been holding back a few notes on a product here that you haven't seen until this moment. I'm going to put it in front of you mm-hmm. and ask you to ad lib a persuasive, believable, informal commercial story based on these bare facts. Okay, let's have a look. Here it is. Okay. Well, I see we're selling shaving cream this time around. Get the facts and show. Oh, this is men in soft soft stroke. Yeah, right. This is going to be a breeze because uh, I use men in soft stroke myself. You do? Mm-hmm. And men in soft stroke makes every morning shaving a real pleasure. It's something I discovered a long time ago, and I can tell you, it's the greatest boon to shavers since the safety razor came on the market. It smells so good, and it feels so refreshing first thing in the morning as a brand new formula. Now, I don't know what's in that formula, but it's a richer feeling when you lather up your face, and for some reason or other, it seems to stay wetter longer. It's a creamy, rich lather that makes it so much easier when it comes around to having to shave. And after all, isn't that the first thing you think about in the morning, fellas? You wake up and you're grumpy and miserable as an old bear, especially when you feel the old whiskers. But when men in soft stroke comes along, all of a sudden you feel better. It's a doggone nice to put it on your face and lather it up. Now, I hope you're going to try some real soon, right now, maybe, eh? Men and Soft Stroke. Remember the name, Men and, next time you're shopping. <laughs> That's amazing. That's quite a demonstration of the ad lib informal commercial. That commercial from Notes, mm-hmm. involving only about eight key words. Well, Pete, some agencies and some advertisers don't like to have their copy changed from the way it's originally written. What rule of thumb can we use here? When do you know that it's all right to ad-lib around the message or personalize the commercial? And when must you rigidly conform to the way it's written? This can be important. Yes, this uh, can be one of the most important things in broadcasting. Now, this comes in your preparation of your complete show. You must realize, too, that whenever you go on the air, you have exactly the format that you're going to follow, just as you have in your wonderful course here, Ed. You have all the things that you have to go through before you go on the air. Now, this is another one. You must find out how a sponsor reacts to his commercial. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the best rule of thumb to follow along this line is to have personal contact with the sponsor. Now, this is possible on a local level with a local sponsor. Mm -hmm. You can phone him or go around and see him. You might say, uh, I'm going to be doing your radio commercials. I understand that we're going to be selling a few new Chevys. Can I take a look at the car I'm selling? Perhaps take one around the block at the feel of it? This way you know exactly what you're selling. Right. Then you get on the air, and you say, Well, folks, we took a little trip down to, shall we say, Acme Chevrolet, saw the new car manager, and he's got a beautiful Mandarin red Chevy convertible. Then you tell him all about the car, and you sell it. Sometimes you even sell yourself, and you park it in the garage. (laughs) Well, in other words, initiative on the part of the commercial announcer is a good thing. Oh, you bet. But uh, let me explain here, Ed, that it must be done in conjunction with the station sales department so that the advertiser isn't confused about who's looking after him or what channels his advertising is going through. Tremendously important. In other words, you and the salesman can work as a team. Right. And then often you'll get a commercial that says no ad lib, as you mentioned a little earlier, and this means that you're under strict orders. You've got to read it exactly as it's written. Well, normally this isn't a problem on the average formatted show, but... It is a consideration when you're dealing with a personality such as you are, Pete, who's -hmm. known for stylizing or ad-libbing the informal commercial. Here's another piece of copy. (laughs) Let's assume that the writer or editor is noted here in bold-face type that Mm -hmm. there must be no ad-lib, that it must be read exactly as is. Now, remembering that the whole tone of your show is informal, and your whole approach is identified with informality, How would you go about handling this? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, You would keep it on the same tone, the same level you've already established, the easy chit-chat as you and I are chatting now. Uh, You might come out of a record with time and temperature and go into some transitional phrase that would tie you right into the commercial, making it easier. Uh, Like, for instance, say, fellas, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about my favorite hairdressing, wild root cream oil. Man, has your hair been looking lifeless lately? Be noticing more dandruff, more falling hair? Well, if so, you need Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff, and it contains lanolin. 
soothing lanolin, an oil resembling the natural oil of your skin. It makes your hair look and feel good all day long. Now, if you've never used Wild Root Cream Oil, don't put it off any longer. Get a bottle today at any drug counter or ask your barber for a professional application. And then you'll know why it's again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Pete, I can see why you have such a long list of happy clients. Thanks for the demonstration and for your sound advice to prospective announcers. The announcer who appears on camera as a commercial announcer or demonstrator must constantly try to develop his technique. Some of the requirements of the demonstrator are a good appearance, good grooming, ability to project personality, and personal poise. A sense of stage presence or poise is perhaps the most difficult quality for most people to acquire. Unless you become accustomed to appearing in public, you are liable to feel extremely self-conscious in front of a TV camera. There is a feeling of putting yourself on the line when you're under such close scrutiny. You will feel that your total appearance and personality are being put under a microscope. You may tend to become overly conscious of what you consider to be shortcomings in your appearance, that you're overweight, underweight, tall or short. Stage training and other forms of public performance are extremely useful background for the on-camera TV performer. This will teach you movement, fitting the action to the words, and generally help to develop your poise and self-confidence and your ability to memorize lines. Ad-lib is of prime importance to a TV staff announcer. Many commercials are ad-libbed from basic facts about the product. This is necessary when you consider that dozens of commercials are produced by a local station every day. Some are done live and some are recorded on videotape for repeated use. Obviously there isn't time, nor is it necessarily desirable, to memorize every announcement word for word. On the other hand, if it's a freelance job produced by an advertising agency, you may be required to deliver the spot exactly as written. This often requires that the announcement be memorized. In some kinds of commercials, it is absolutely essential that you memorize your lines in advance. With others, you may be able to work from a teleprompter or cue cards. However, if there's a fair amount of movement on your part, it will be impossible to keep your eyes glued to the lines on a teleprompter. There are many techniques for memorizing lines, but the underlying principles of memory development apply to almost every one. Supposing you're given a TV commercial to memorize, here are some rules to guide you. First of all, when you study your script, be sure you read it aloud when you're practicing. Reading it silently to yourself is not enough. Read the entire announcement and try to retain all of it, rather than trying to memorize one part at a time. This way you'll master the connections and links between the various parts. Don't try to cram your memorizing into one session. You will learn more surely and more quickly if you space your sessions. This is true of every kind of learning. Try to associate the facts and ideas in the script with as many other facts and ideas as you can. On the subject of memory, William James had this to say. In mental terms, the more other facts a fact is associated with in the mind, the better possession of it our memory retains. Each of its associates becomes a hook to which it hangs, a means to fish it up by when sunk beneath the surface. The secret of a good memory is thus the secret of forming diverse and multiple associations with every fact we care to retain. So, form clear mental pictures of everything you're talking about. Each visualized idea will become strongly associated with the words and phrases in the script. By memorizing the script as a whole, you'll be able to remember the ideas in their proper sequence. It's vitally important that you relate your lines to the required physical movements. TV scripts always indicate the video or picture content on the left-hand side, and the audio or spoken part directly opposite on the right-hand side. If you memorize your lines as you would a poem, you'll be in trouble. 
you must be constantly aware of what your movements will be as you deliver a particular line. This is part of the technique of association. A teleprompter is a device that attaches directly to the front of the camera. The entire script is written word for word in large type, exactly the same as the sample that goes with this lesson. The script moves on a roller, and the speed can be varied by the cameraman. In reading a teleprompter, visual acuity is obviously important. Pin the sample script to the wall and see if you can read it at varying distances. If you have trouble reading it from 10 to 12 feet away, you'd better have your eyes examined. Remember too, it may be far more difficult to see under the bright lights. Learn to scan teleprompter copy so that you can absorb a couple of lines at one glance. This will eliminate that familiar fixed stare that's a dead giveaway that the person on camera is carefully reading the teleprompter script word by word. Physical movements on camera will usually be determined by the script or by the director. The script will specify when major movements are required, such as opening a car door or lifting a package from a shelf. Lesser movements, such as hand movements, are often left to the discretion of the announcer. Broad or excessive hand movements are one of the common pitfalls of the beginner and sometimes even the experienced on-camera demonstrator. Unless there's a good reason for a hand gesture, it's much better to keep them at your sides. As Shakespeare put it, do not saw the air too much with your hand, but treat all gently. Personal idiosyncrasies are highly magnified on camera. Avoid straightening your tie, scratching your nose, moving your head from side to side for emphasis, and other mannerisms that detract from a smooth, easy performance. On the other hand, Try not to be mechanical and wooden. Learn to think of the camera as a single human being, not just a camera. As in radio, try to communicate with a single imaginary listener. The function of the announcer or demonstrator is to help to get the sales story across. He must never detract from it or draw attention away from it. I'm sure that as a viewer, you'll agree that on many occasions, you've wondered why the announcer was on camera at all. Many advertising men contend that the commercial announcer should be heard but not seen on television, that his physical presence distracts the listener from the commercial message. This is what one prominent advertising man has termed vampire video. He claims that viewers will watch the announcer's clothes, his looks and his movements, and because the audience can receive only one strong mental impression at a time, that the announcer often intrudes upon the commercial rather than strengthening it. How valid this opinion is, is naturally open to debate, but it's certainly obvious that the announcer should be a harmonious, functional, useful part of the commercial message, or he shouldn't be on camera. To avoid the danger of vampire video, he should be careful to avoid loud or unusual clothing, extraneous movements and mannerisms, and anything else that will focus on due attention on him to the detriment of the product. A TV announcer should be sure he has an adequate wardrobe. He obviously can't be seen in the same clothes, show after show and day after day. He should have at least a dozen different outfits. The same principles of dress apply here as apply to general dress. His clothing should be harmonious with his personality, his build, his coloring. He should build a variety of outfits to suit every mood and every occasion. It's all right for a sportscaster to wear a sports jacket, but it would look undignified and out of place on a news commentator. In black and white television, all colors are seen as varying shades of gray. The announcer should keep this in mind in relation to his wardrobe. Practice your on-camera commercials in front of a full-length mirror. Refine your movements and your techniques just as you would if you were a boxer or a dancer. Use the practice TV commercial scripts that accompany this lesson and create additional ones on your own. The radio or a TV interview may feature personalities and human interest. It may be designed to entertain or inform.
It may be casual and spontaneous. It may be carefully planned and scripted. Whatever the purpose of the interview may be, it's the job of the interviewer to put himself in the place of the listeners and to ask the questions he feels they would like to ask. The interviewer should remain constantly aware of the purpose of the interview and try to keep it from sliding into side issues and wandering off course. He should participate fully in the discussion rather than just ask questions. Short questions and long answers tend to sound unnatural. The interviewer should be constantly alert, ready to ask insightful questions, ready to clarify obscure terms or complex answers, and be able to break them down into digestible size. In short, he should guide the entire talk in an orderly sequence of ideas to a logical conclusion. It should also be remembered that most interviews have time limitations. On a short interview that's restricted to a time limit of, say, three minutes, the scope of questioning should be such that the story can be well developed within that specific time. Obviously, if a longer period of time is allocated, both parties can go into somewhat more detail in evolving the subject. As an example, let's assume that we're about to conduct an interview on a program we'll call People in the News. Our time limit is three minutes. What would you think if you heard an interview that sounded like this? This is Ed McRae with another edition of People in the News. Interesting interviews with people who made today's news. We have a gentleman in the studio today. We're going to ask him his name. What's your name, sir? Uh, my name's Bill Towers. Bill Towers. Uh-huh. And where do you live, Bill? Uh, I live uh, just outside the city. I see. I understand that you had quite an exciting experience this afternoon. Uh, yes, I did. Yes, well, would, would you mind telling us just what that experience was? Well, uh, I was at the races this afternoon, Ed, and I uh, won a lot of money on the Daily Double. Well, isn't that wonderful? Uh... What exactly is the Daily Double? Well, you see, Ed, you take a ticket and you pick a horse in the first race and then you pick a horse in a second race, and if they both win their races, well, you get what's known as the Daily Double then. Oh, I see. And you said you won a lot of money. Exactly how much money did you win? Uh, about $8,000. $8,000? Well, isn't that wonderful? Uh, yes, that's wonderful, Ed. Uh, you said you bet on one race... And then you bet on another race. Now, uh, how many races do you have that, that you can bet on? Well, you have eight races on a card, Ed, but you only have two in the Daily Double. You see, you pick a horse in the first race, and you pick a horse in the second race. Uh, this is before you have the first race, Ed. And if the two horses win, uh, the first horse wins the first race, and the second horse wins the second race, then your ticket wins, and you, you collect the money. Well, what exactly do you mean you, you have to bet before the race? Now, that's certainly standard practice, isn't it? Oh, yeah, you, you bet before both races, Ed. You know, you bet on a horse in the first race and a horse in the second race. Oh, before any races have been run at all? Uh-huh. Oh, yes, well, I think that makes that clear. Now, uh, how do you know how much you won? Well, uh, they add up all the money that was paid on daily double tickets, and they divide that by the number of winning tickets, and uh, roughly that gives you an idea of uh, how much you won. Uh, of course, our government takes quite a lump off the top first, you know. They, they always do. <laughs> well, yes, I'm afraid they're well known for that, all right. As a matter of fact, I recall reading something about a movie star who, back when taxes were even heavier, uh, he was only getting about two cents out of his income out of every dollar. The government was taking all the rest. Yeah, and you see those boxers in there, too, you know. They, they make a million bucks, you know. One fight, one million bucks, and, and all they see is about 10000 uh, But, you know, that's not bad. I wouldn't mind getting socked in a jaw for 10000 bucks. No, I guess not. I just got my tax bill on the house the other day, you know. I don't know what they're doing around here in the city, but I guess the same all over the place. You know, the taxes are just going up and up every day. Well, I, I guess anyway, Bill, you'll have enough to pay your taxes now. Yeah, and I was reading one of those things in the paper the other day, you know, where, where someone won something on a quiz program or something. Oh, like yes, well, I, I'm sorry I see our time is up. Oh, sorry, uh, Thank you very much and lots of luck to you, Bill Towers. Thanks once again for appearing on our program, People in the News. Well, that's a rather extreme example of how not to conduct an interview. The interviewer obviously had no basic knowledge of the subject under discussion. He failed to set the scene or precondition the audience about the purpose of the interview. He allowed it to wander off course. He didn't ask the right questions, and he didn't seem to be aware of his three-minute time limit. To top it off, he showed obviously bad judgment in pursuing the subject of government taxation. 
Although even this could have been handled tastefully, his approach was ill-informed, inaccurate, and tinged with prejudice. Let's take the same guest, the same subject matter, and the same time limit, and demonstrate an example of how it might be done, conforming to the principles I mentioned earlier. Tonight, People in the News welcomes Mr. William Towers of Sleepy Hollow, who today won $8,000 on the Daily Double at the City Downs. Now, Mr. Towers, that's a fantastic amount to win on one Daily Double ticket. As a matter of fact, I understand it's a track record. Uh, yes, it is. Uh... For those who may not be familiar with racing terminology, what is the Daily Double? Well, you, you pick the number of a horse in each of the first and second races, Ed, and if uh, those two horses win, uh, then you collect. And how much did you wager on the ticket? Oh, mine was a $2 bet, Ed. Uh, of course, you can bet considerably more than that. What determines the amount you win? Well, uh, roughly the total amount bet on all the daily double tickets is divided by the number of uh, winning tickets. Uh, after the government deducted its lump off the talk for taxes, of course. Uh-huh. How do you pick your horses, Mr. Towers? Any special system? Oh, actually, it really has nothing to do with the horses at all. Uh, I always buy a ticket on numbers two and three. And what is the significance of two and three? Or is that a professional secret? Oh, oh no secret, Ed. Uh, back home on the farm, there's a Ma and Pa, uh, 11 brothers and sisters, and six other relatives, uh, two dogs and a cat, <laughs> me, of course, uh, making 23 or uh, two and three in all. Everybody uh, contributes something, and I uh, buy a daily double ticket at least once during the racing season <laughs> in the city. And just how long has your little company been in operation, Mr. Towers? Oh, uh, this is our ninth season, Ed. Mm -hmm. Any previous winners? I'm afraid not. Well, I've certainly never been fortunate to win such a, an amount of money myself, but I've always wondered, just how do they pay you an amount like $8,000? In cash? By check? Do they have a, a big bag there to scoop all the bills into, or what? <laughs> I just learned myself, Ed. Uh, for amounts under $1,000, uh, they want to pay you in cash. Uh, mm -hmm. Over that, uh, you have your choice, uh, either cash or check. And how did you take yours? Well, I took a one uh, $1,000 bill. I'd mostly take home and show it to the family. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rest I took in a check. It's just like a government check, you know, since this is really run by those government fellows. And Have you had time to plan just how you're going to spend all that money, Mr. Towers? Oh, that was decided uh, long ago. Uh, young Johnny, uh, he's our youngest brother. Uh, he's 11. Well, he won this festival competition for playing the piano. Uh, highest marks ever awarded. And was invited to attend a special music school here in the city. Of course, we uh, couldn't afford it then, but uh, now maybe we can see that he gets there. No personal plans? Well, I'd uh, like a new hunting rifle for myself, but uh, I think I'd like to get a few presents for the rest of them, too. <laughs> well, with 23 presents to buy, you have a full shopping schedule ahead of you, Mr. Towers. Our best wishes for future success and a young Johnny. Our thanks for appearing on tonight's edition of People in the News. In our second example, we stated the name of our guest and the reason for the interview at the very beginning, and we quickly established the facts of the story. The interviewer reflected at least enough familiarity with the basic subject of racing. He avoided dwelling on the obvious and meaningless aspects and planned his questions to heighten the elements of human interest. He guided the entire interview with a good sequence of questions through to its logical conclusion, and did it all within his three-minute time limit. To develop your technique, practice interviewing your family and friends. Pick subjects with which you are both familiar. This is important. Set a definite time limit and try to conform to the basic principles I've outlined. Ad lib in action. Those four words represent a double-edged mode of vocal expression. Ad-lib in action can mean power and impact, an exciting special event, a vivid reflection of sights and sounds, a stimulating interview, or simply a humorous quip. Ad-lib is a contraction of a Latin phrase, ad libitum, meaning as you wish or as you please. To the announcer, it means working without a script maybe without notes, on a variety of broadcast assignments. You must never confuse it with another Latin phrase in common use, ad infinitum, because this means to go on and on indefinitely, or to be guilty of never knowing when to stop. Here to discuss ad lib in action is Fred Whiting, 
one of the nation's top newscasters and special events reporters. First of all, Fred, what should an announcer do to develop this ability to ad-lib? Well, I think it would be most important for him, Ed, to develop a broad and colorful vocabulary which he can use with flexibility. In this regard, I've been fortunate because as a youngster, I had a natural curiosity about words. I never let a word or place name or name of an object go by to remain in my memory only as a word without meaning. And I think once started, this becomes a lifetime habit. Well, I agree this is most important, Fred. Now, it's obvious that a great deal of preparation goes on behind the scenes before the listener hears the smooth flowing ad lib broadcast on the air. Let's use a hypothetical example and say that you're assigned to cover the Memorial Day parade on radio. You have 24 hours notice in which to prepare. Now, with all the different units, the different uniforms, the various banners and the bands that may be involved, how would you go about preparing yourself to do an accurate and lucid word picture? Well, you picked a real dandy, Ed. I think the first to be realized here is that there would be a great deal of detail that must be researched in preparation because people's reputations, regimental honors, must be remembered or someone is going to be slighted. A paramount thing I think one must consider in preparing for such a broadcast is this. You must realize that you are going to be there, you are going to be watching the parade, you will see it, you will hear it. Now your listeners on radio can only hear it, so you must be their eyes at that parade. You must place yourself in their position. You must think in this fashion. If you were the listener, what would you want to know about the Memorial Day Parade? Now, as an individual, I might be most keenly interested in the artillery regiments. But I would have to keep in mind that there would be a great many naval veterans in the audience and people who might have a particular love for the Air Force. So I would attempt to cover the thing from every point of view to see and describe what everyone would like to see. In other words, everything that takes place, every unit, well, in fact, every person who takes part in that parade, is important to at least one member of your audience. That's very true, Ed. And so that no element of the parade would be neglected, I would contact the parade marshal because he would be able to provide a full rundown on every unit in the parade. The number of men in each unit, the number of units, the order of march, that is the order in which you could expect them to appear before you, at the broadcast point. And to really do a job on this thing, one could check on the regimental history of each unit involved, because each one has won its battle honors in some campaign or another, and they're very proud of these. And I might have several hundred veterans of that regiment listening to the broadcast. Well, that sounds like a tremendous amount of legwork, Fred. We should assume, then, that the ad lib reporter should develop the same kind of facility as the broadcast news reporter, or the newspaper reporter in learning how to gather facts. Yes, he must think in that same way, Ed, as the newsman would think. But please, not so much legwork, because if he did 24 hours legwork in preparation for all this research, he'd be in no physical condition to do the broadcast. So <laughs> let's just say diligent digit work. Right, use the telephone. But the real point, Ed, is this, however you want to phrase it, complete preparation is absolutely vital. What about short notice assignments, Fred, where we're faced with applying this broad vocabulary and facility with words and broad general knowledge to create mental pictures? Supposing, for example, you have, well, say, three or four minutes notice, and your assignment is to cover something like a fire, a robbery, an accident, or something of that sort. Again, general awareness, general knowledge, knowing a little bit about a lot of things. And if you can't go into the details, such as you would with 24 hours preparation, then you've got to go mainly with what strikes the eye. You must go to color and to sight and to sound. In other words, transpose everything you see into words in a subjective way. And one more thing, Ed. An announcer might have at his command every feature, every factor we've discussed. But unless he can develop a keen concentration he'll never be able to harness them. He must see everything that is going on, but not be distracted by irrelevant occurrences. What about immediate situations, Fred, supposing you have no notice whatsoever? Is this the most difficult of all? This could be if you don't approach it in the right fashion, Ed. First, 
you must have a clear mental picture of what is in front of you and then proceed from feature to feature to project it into the minds of your listeners. You know, it's a very curious thing about this, Ed, this technique. I sometimes try to analyze what I do in ad-lib broadcasting afterward, and I certainly can't. I rather doubt whether a psychologist or a psychiatrist could tell me what happens mechanically. But I think my mind works in two sections, or perhaps I should say my mind works 10 to 15 words ahead of what my tongue is saying. Oh, in other words, there is, there's something on the threshold of consciousness that's well, waiting in abeyance till it's time to spring forth. You're thinking of two things at the same time, one consciously, while the other is just below the surface. Ed, that is a very good ad lib. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, now, this is sort of putting you on the spot, Fred, but how about a demonstration of ad lib in action? As an example of spontaneous expression and description, would you mind describing the room in which we're sitting right now? Well, I think that's not really too difficult an assignment, Ed, because a very clear mental picture comes. So on this short notice, I'll rely on the broad impression and then try to describe the picture. Strength is the keynote in this room. That's the impression I get. Perhaps this comes from the focal point in the room, this large walnut desk with chrome legs and trim. I would say it's an imposing executive type desk which very properly belongs in the office of the National Institute of Broadcasting. The desk is flanked on one side by a walnut and chrome cadenza, which I would estimate to be about seven feet long. On the other side, another cabinet styled in the same decor. In some rooms, these features would be overpowering, but your high ceilings here, which I would estimate at 10 feet, and the floor size of about 15 by 15, seem to handle the features quite nicely. The color tone in the room is a harmonious one. The golden oak veneer of the walls very nicely sets off the darker tone of these walnut fixtures. And the mushroom broadloom carpeting marries these into a very harmonious scheme. Again, I must say, an impression of quiet strength and purpose. Well, Fred, that's really an excellent, perhaps I should say a remarkable demonstration, of this facility of transposing what you see into vivid word pictures. What are some other things an aspiring announcer can do to practice this technique? Well, I think he has the opportunity for the practice, Ed, in every conversation he has with friends or relatives or acquaintances, just as he can practice his vocabulary and facility of speech. Because each of us a hundred times a day recounts some experience or incident to a friend or a workmate. And this is where you can train yourself in telling the story as you recall it in its proper order so that you're not traveling backward and forward, thus confusing your listener. You know what you saw or what you're relating. You know the elements involved, the people involved. You know their chronological order. So you simply begin at the beginning and follow the thread through to the end. There are some cases where you might make a switch and put the key point of the incident at the beginning to, uh, well, as they say, a catcher or a grabber. Mm -hmm. You could start the thing off to gain attention by relating the highlight point. Then go on to explain how this perhaps unfortunate but humorous thing occurred, keeping everything in order. And then when you've told all you know about it in as few words as possible, you've done the job. Let's run over those points again. Things you can do to develop the technique of ad-lib broadcasting. First of all, build a broad and rich vocabulary and learn to use it. Develop a wide general knowledge of the world around you. Learn to organize your approach and how to prepare for any assignment, both those that may involve advance notice and those that may involve extremely short notice. Permeate your mind with knowledge about every aspect of the subject matter. Think in terms of mental pictures rather than specific words. Don't try to plan your wording in advance. If you grope for the clever or descriptive phrase you thought of before you went on the air, your whole presentation will bog down. If you are thoroughly familiar with the subject matter, the words will come of their own accord. Practice your technique frequently, and if possible, use a tape recorder. Practice describing the objects and people around you, and try relating accurate and detailed descriptions of your everyday experiences. Mastery of the technique of ad lib requires preparation, application, 
concentration, and plenty of practice. There are many types and styles of narration, but whatever the assignment may be, remember that narration is simply storytelling. The average announcer may seldom be required to deliver dramatic or a documentary narration, but there is a demand from many sources for the performer who can deliver a convincing job as a narrator. His services are always in demand for radio and television and for radio, TV, and film documentaries. Let's review the most common categories of narration and how to approach them. Our first example is a narrative passage that sets a scene or mood. As with all other vocal interpretation, your tone, force, intonation, and other components of expression should be carefully geared to match the mood of what you're saying. Here's an example of the approach you might use in setting a simple scene. The color of the leaves deepened, and there came a season of beauty, singular and sad, like a smile left upon the face of the dead summer. Over all things near and far, the forest where it met the sky, the nearer woods, the great river and the streams that empty into it, there hung a blue haze, soft and dreamlike. The forest became a painted forest with an ever-thinning canopy and an ever-thickening carpet of crimson and gold. Everywhere there was a low rustling underfoot and a slow rain of color. It was neither cold nor hot, but very quiet, and the birds went by like shadows. The narrator should actually project himself into the mood or feeling of what he's talking about. So far as the listener is concerned, the narrator is really the story happening. This is especially true with radio, where you have only the single sense of hearing with which to create your mood or set your scene. In this case, the voice must do it all. Every change of pitch, every intonation, every vocal shading must help to create a sharp image or emotional response in the mind of the listener. Now let's examine the realm of dramatic narration. This is outside the normal scope of announcing, but remembering that many announcers also pursue the art of acting, at least as an avocation, let's consider the category of narration called the stream of consciousness. In this type of narration, you are playing the part of someone else. The action is taking place in the present, and your conscious thoughts are put into words. The narration must be matched to the action that's taking place. In the following passage, the narrator has gained entry to a private office by bluffing his way past the secretary. He had previously been caught in the act of shoplifting and is trying to find any incriminating documents or reports in the store manager's office so he can destroy them. Oh, I thought she'd never leave. Ten minutes ago, he'll be here any time. I have to see that report before he gets back. He said anything about me in it, I'll tear it up. And I'll make him see it my way. Well, he can't ruin a man's life like this. He'll see that. He'll phone Mr. Johnson. He'll tell him it was a mistake, a, a misunderstanding. The bank will take his word for it. They probably didn't believe him anyway. Now, where would he keep a report? Delivery slips, receipts. That's this. Price changes. Oh, that's no good. Oh, what a sloppy operation. He wouldn't last five minutes in the bank. Uh, nothing under the ledgers. Oh, maybe in the desk, top drawer. Yeah. Oh, advertising stuff. Value buy the most for the least. Uh, any bargain you get from Macklin, it'd be a... Oh, here. Reports, weekly report file. Oh, I got it now, quick, quick. Volume of business, stock turnover, cash reports. There's nothing here about me. Nothing in the report. He was bluffing. He just called the bank to be spiteful. He wanted me to lose my job. $38 in the bank, and he wants to get even with me. Why, he envies me. I know. I know. It's a threat. He, he's going to blackmail me, bleed me. Oh, he can't do that. It, it's against the law. I'll have him arrested. 
act when I should have known uh, he can't bluff me. I'll call the police. In that example of active narration, the story is unfolding at the precise instant in time that the narrator is telling it. In our next example, the perspective of time is somewhat split. The story is narrated in the past tense. It has already happened, but the narrator is relating the experience as if it were happening all over again. This is another example of active narration, but this time we'll add another dimension. The central character or narrator is in an abnormal physical state. He has been severely beaten by a couple of thugs in a subway stop and left for dead. His most severe injuries are in the abdominal area, which will affect his diaphragm. Again, we must match our words to the action with the added circumstance of physical injury. I went out again, and it was a long time before I came to. I was awakened by the stench of the room and the cold stab of the floor. I had to get up. I had to get out of that room. I painfully pulled myself up and went to the door. I opened the door. As I did, I could feel sharp shooting pains cut across my abdomen. I couldn't breathe. Each breath was like a jab, cutting jab in the ribs. I realized I was badly hurt and that I should keep still, but I knew that if I stayed in that room, I'd die. The platform was empty, completely empty. I leaned against the wall. I expected to find at least one person who could help me. Everything seemed lost, and I could feel the pain overwhelming me. I pulled myself through the gate and made it to the stairs. I held onto the banister and pulled myself up the stairs. One, two, three, four, four steps. I couldn't go any further. I sat down. I looked up at the street. It was daylight morning and the sun was streaming into the subway the day was awakening people would be going to work the sun was warm very warm i sat there looking at the clouds the sky the sun of course dramatic narration is also done in character voices and dialects these are specialized fields of dramatics that are a complete study in themselves. For our purposes, the last chief category of narration is the documentary. This can run the full gamut. It may deal with famous objects, events, or personalities, or any combination of the three. The example we'll use in this lesson is from the sports world. It's a dramatic documentary narrative about baseball's immortal Babe Ruth. The controversy still goes on as to whether Roger Maris of the Yankees is the home run king with his 61 over the new extended season, or whether the Babe remains the king with his 60 homers. Actually, it makes little difference, for there never will be another Babe Ruth. Never has one man ever been such a single symbol of a sport as the beloved Bambino. As they say in the trade, the Babe even looked good striking out. Ruth was nearing the end of the trail when the Yankees cut him loose in 1935. The bay was nearing 40, and those spindly legs were growing tired from carrying that huge body through the years. But baseball was the very lifeblood of Ruth, and he eagerly grabbed at the chance when offered a job by the old Boston Braves. The fans at Pittsburgh didn't realize it at the time, but they were seeing baseball history on the afternoon of May 25th in 1935. Red Lucas was on the hill for the Pirates when Ruth stepped in in the first inning and put one into the right field seats. Came the third inning, and it was Guy Bush throwing for the Pirates. It made no difference to the babe, who drove another one into Ruthville. 
There was a man on base in the fifth inning when the babe again dug in on the left side of the plate. The crowd pleaded for another homer, but the best Ruth could do was come up with a run-producing single. Despite the heroics of Ruth, the Pirates held a 76 lead in the seventh inning. But not for long. One swing was all the Bambino needed, and it was a tie game as the ball sailed deep into the right field stands. The crowd rose as a man and cheered as the babe with his feigned wincing steps pigeon-toed his way around the bases. Fathers took time out to tell of the boy from an orphanage who broke into the majors as a left-handed pitcher. The youngsters stopped munching on the hot dogs and listened wide-eyed as their elders retold the story of the man around whom the Yankees built a stadium. The cheers continued as Ruth stepped on home plate, tipped his cap in appreciation for the applause, and ducked into the Boston dugout. The crowd settled back and watched the game, hoping that Ruth would get another time at bat. He didn't, and the fans filed from the park still talking about those three home runs. They wondered how many more homers Ruth would hit before his career ended. The answer was to be no more. That third homer against Pittsburgh was Ruth's 714th, a figure that still stands and probably will forever. A few days later, the babe announced he was hanging up his glove. The babe had bowed out in typical fashion by giving both old and young fans a final example of what had made Babe Ruth Mr. Baseball. Narration may encompass many moods and many purposes. To develop your scope as a narrator, practice the material you've heard in this lesson, and also the material that goes with it. And above all, remember what I said earlier. Narration is simply storytelling. Try to match your approach to the mood and feeling of the story.